This is Bibles Down on How to Be Christian, where we put our Bibles down and we discuss topics using information that is more widely accepted than just the information that's found in the Bible. Today we'll be responding to a video called The Bible is Pro-Abortion, Poor Republicans Don't Know It. So ironically, we'll be putting our Bibles down, but then we'll be showing you someone picking our Bibles up in just a few minutes. And that someone else is Cenk Uygur of the Young Turks. Now according to the Young Turks YouTube About page, they claim to be the largest online news show in the world. And that may be true, but I feel it's dependent on their definition of the word news, because I typically think of news as factual information. Dictionary.com refers to news as intelligence, information, and if you watch The Young Turks, they're more of an opinion-based show, and they don't always do a great job at presenting truthful information. But don't just take my word for it. Do you have no idea who I am? I could be lying to you right now. I'm a fish. So don't just take me at my word. Let's watch this thing. So voters in both Alabama and West Virginia approved ballot initiatives on Tuesday, which was the day of the midterm elections, that will update the state constitutions to declare that abortion rights are not guaranteed. And of course, this is a move that will severely curtail reproductive rights in the states. So this is Anna Kasparian. She's one of the hosts on The Young Turks. And she's reading something from a source called Think Progress. She continues. These ballot initiatives straight out ban abortion. As soon as the Supreme Court, if the Supreme Court, rolls back Roe v. Wade or does away with Roe v. Wade, that's when these ballot initiatives go into effect, essentially outright banning abortion. Now in um, Alabama, it goes a little further because they would give personhood rights to a fetus, a zygote. Now judging by Anna's tone there, it doesn't seem like she thinks giving a fetus or a zygote personhood rights is a good idea. We're going to listen to more from her in a minute, but I do want to clarify something here. According to science, a fetus is a living human being. According to science, a zygote is a living human being. In a textbook called Before We Are Born, Essentials of Embryology and Birth Defects, there's a section called Introduction to Human Embryology, and it says, Human development begins when an oocyte, I apologize if my pronunciation is wrong here, but human development begins when an oocyte, ovum from a female, is fertilized by a sperm, spermatozoan from a male. Development involves many changes that transform a single cell, the zygote, fertilized ovum, into a multicellular human being. Embryology is concerned with the origin and development of a human being from a zygote to birth. The stages of development before birth are shown in figures 1-1 and 7-3. And in figure 1-1, we can see that the zygote is included as one of the stages of development for a human. We'll put the links to those figures in the description of this video. So if anyone wants to check those out, feel free to do so. Another textbook, Human Embryology and Teratology, tells us that although life is a continuous process, fertilization is a critical landmark because under ordinary circumstances, a new genetically distinct human organism is thereby formed. So science tells us that life is a continuous process and a new, genetically distinct human organism is formed at fertilization, at least under ordinary circumstances. The fertilized ovum is referred to as the zygote. The zygote is living, it is genetically distinct, and it is a human organism. Science teaches that the zygote is a new, genetically distinct, living human. So this is a different human organism from the human organism that it is currently inside of, the mother. Now Anna just said this. In um, Alabama, it goes a little further because they would give personhood rights to a fetus, a zygote. To which I would say, way to go Alabama. That would make sense when you consider this scientifically and linguistically. Because personhood, according to dictionary.com, can mean the state or fact of being a person. And a person can be a human being, whether an adult or child, or a human being as distinguished from an animal or a thing. So seeing as a zygote and a fetus are both scientifically classified as genetically distinct living human organisms, it makes perfect sense that Alabama would grant these living human organisms with personhood rights. It's not hard for a zygote and a fetus to meet those qualifications. Now you may be saying to yourself, well you're looking at dictionary definitions, what about legal definitions? You may also be asking, why do you sound so stuffed up? And it's because we record these narrations separately and I'm sick now. Deal with it. I am. The law states that in determining the meaning of any act of Congress, or of any ruling, regulation, or interpretation of the various administrative bureaus and agencies of the United States, the words person, human being, child, and individual shall include every infant member of the species Homo sapiens who is born alive at any stage of development. And then it explains how the term born alive is used in this section. It says that the term born alive with respect to a member of the species Homo sapiens means the complete expulsion or extraction from his or her mother of that member at any stage of development, who after such expulsion or extraction breathes or has a beating heart, pulsation of the umbilical cord, or definite movement of voluntary muscles, regardless of whether the umbilical cord has been cut. 
and regardless of whether the expulsion or extraction occurs as a result of natural or induced labor, cesarean section, or induced abortion. So if a member of the species Homo sapiens pops out of his or her mother and does this, 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 or this, regardless of this, and regardless of any of this, and remember that's at any stage of development, if that happens then legally they can be considered a person, human being, child, or individual. That law also goes on to say that nothing in this section shall be construed to affirm, deny, expand, or contract any legal status or legal right applicable to any member of the species Homo sapiens at any point prior to being born alive, as defined in this section. So even the law recognizes that there are instances in which a member of the species Homo sapiens might have legal status or legal right even prior to being born alive. So legally, zygotes and fetuses can be classified as a person, human being, child, or individual. Again, nothing in this section shall be used to affirm any legal status or legal right applicable to any member of the species Homo sapiens at any point prior to being born alive as defined in this section. So we're not saying that this section of law gives zygotes and fetuses legal status or legal rights. But we're just pointing out that nothing in this section shall be construed to deny any legal status or legal right applicable to any member of the species Homo sapiens at any point prior to being born alive as defined in this section. So this section recognizes that there is a possibility that a zygote and a fetus could have legal status or legal right, and it's clarifying that this section has no weight in those matters, at least in terms of affirming, denying, expanding, or contracting those statuses or rights. The point being, even in terms of legal definitions, there's nothing that would prohibit giving personhood rights to zygotes and fetuses. So let's hear what Anna says next. They would give personhood rights to a fetus, a zygote. Sperm, though, sperm is not life. So that's kind of a confusing statement because it's kind of like saying crocodile is not life. Technically, crocodile and sperm are not life, as in life doesn't necessarily mean sperm or crocodile. The words aren't synonyms. So in a way, Anna is correct there. But to say sperm is not life would be like me saying, I am not life, because I'm not life. I have life, but I'm personally not life. Likewise, sperm is not life, but sperm does have life. Unless it's dead, of course, in which case it doesn't have life anymore. A quick search on WebMD answers the question of how long do sperm live? The answer depends on a number of things. They'll likely live longer in warm, wet places. They can die fairly quickly, but they can also live up to five days depending on the conditions. Now, I don't doubt that Anna already knows this information. I think she's probably well aware that sperm does have life. I'm only pointing this out because I feel like for a news organization, articulating points clearly should be a little higher on the priority list. The point that I think that Anna is trying to get across is that sperm does not have a human life. Because while sperm can be living, it is not living a human life. It's living a sperm life. Living that sperm life. I can see the t-shirts already. That all being said, it doesn't change the fact that zygotes and fetuses can be living, and they can be living a genetically distinct human life. Now things are about to get weird with Hannah, so let's listen. Sperm, though, sperm is not life. It's only life as soon as it enters a woman's body. That's when it's considered life. Okay, so I'm pretty sure this is just Anna trying to mock people here. The problem though is that the people she's mocking don't actually exist. Nobody is saying that sperm is not life until it enters a woman's body. And again, that's a weird way of wording it. Sperm can be living before it enters a woman's body. Sperm can be living as it enters the woman's body. Sperm can be living inside the woman's body. According to WebMD, up to five days. Living that sperm life. Now it seems like Anna is just misrepresenting the scientific teaching that sperm can fertilize the oocyte in order to create the zygote, which is a new genetically distinct living human organism, which is why people who accept the science on this issue will say that sperm is not a living human life, but through fertilization, sperm can create a new genetically distinct human life, while still understanding the science that not all sperm does that. A lot of them just die not living that sperm life. But what Anna is saying there doesn't even come close to representing what the scientific community is saying about this topic. Now I'm not saying Anna can't mock the people she's mocking. If she wants to use her platform on the news show to make fun of people who most likely don't exist, then she can take the same advice I give people who want to put holes in their lawn, which is go for it. Living that pun life. So next up, Anna is going to go into what is typical behavior for the people of the Young Turks. I'm just going to play the clip and then we'll talk about it. All the children who are living on the streets right now who have no food because Republican politicians believe in cutting funding for food programs like SNAP, those people's lives don't matter. Those children's lives don't matter. Who cares about them? All of those children who are risking their lives right now to cross into the United States, cross through Mexico into the United States to seek asylum out of fear for their own lives. They're not people. We don't care about their lives. But as long as there's a zygote in a woman's body, that's when it matters. So this is nothing new for the Young Turks. They get very emotional about things, which isn't always bad. It's not bad to be emotional about things. But the problem is they get emotional and then instead of just sticking to the facts, they just start painting this fictionalized picture that they want you to see instead of what reality actually shows. 
Did you notice how Anna isn't quoting anyone as actually having said those terrible things? Did you notice how Anna is trying to paint these people in Alabama as people who don't care about humans after they are born? But she doesn't even supply a single quote to back up her claims? That's because Anna doesn't have any facts that would back up her claims. Anna is just regurgitating the same nonsense that pro-choice people like Anna have resorted to when they have nothing of value to actually add to the conversation. And note that I'm saying pro-choice people like Anna. I'm not saying all pro-choice people. There's lots of pro-choice people out there who do accept the teachings of science, they do know that pro-life people care about life at any age, and they realize that these arguments that Anna is making just don't hold any water. Just like my pronunciation of the word water doesn't hold any water. Because it is water. I am without a doubt pronouncing water wrong when I say water. I've tried to say it correctly, I know I'm saying it wrong, I can read the comments. It's so hard to talk about baptism. But that's off topic, let's get back to this. So Anna is implying that there are people out there who want to save children before they are born, but then after they're born, they just don't care about them. These people that Anna is talking about probably don't exist outside of delusion, but let's pretend for a minute that they do exist here in reality. Let's say that there's people out there who want to protect the lives of humans before they're born, but then after they're born, they don't consider them people, and they don't care about their lives. They're not people. We don't care about their lives. Again, we're doing a hypothetical here because the people Anna is talking about likely don't exist at all. Maybe you can find one or two nutcases who believe in this, but that is a big maybe. But let's be generous and say a group of people like this do exist. How would pointing this out help out Anna at all? Because all she would be doing is pointing out a group of people who think life should be protected at one stage, but then not protected in another. And Anna herself is a person who thinks life should be protected in one stage, but not protected in another. So even if Anna could prove that these type of people exist, then she still has a huge problem of explaining what her point is. Because if her point is, hey, these people don't care about life in all stages, so they're bad, then she just attacked herself too because she also doesn't care about life in all stages, which would make her bad as well. And to be clear, I'm not saying that is Anna's argument. She actually doesn't really elaborate on what she's talking about here. But the point is, any argument she makes against that fictional group of people can also be applied to her because she also doesn't care about life in all of its stages. But again, this is all just hypothetical because the group that Anna is talking about doesn't exist. Pro-life people care about life in all of its stages. It doesn't matter whether you're male or female. It doesn't matter what your race is. It doesn't matter what your skin color is. It doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't matter what your viewpoints are. It doesn't matter if you host a news show that promotes opinions over facts. Pro-life people care about all life at all stages. So at this point in the video, Jenk Uger chimes in. I don't know if you know this, Hannah. That way they can tell you what to do with your body. That's exactly I'm right. I'm sure that, that was just a random coincidence. Pro-life people want to tell both women and men what not to do with their bodies. I feel it is a very simple and reasonable request. Do not use your human body to kill another human's body. That's it. That's what pro-life people are asking. There might be some good religious people out there who genuinely believe that it's life at the moment of conception. Oftentimes, those are the religious people who don't try to force their religion down our throats. Okay, so now Anna is resorting to another common pro-life tactic, which is to try to frame this discussion as a religious issue. She talks about religious people who believe that it's life at the moment of conception, but she fails to mention that those religious people are also scientific people who believe in the science that teaches life begins at the moment of conception. Anyway, the nonsense continues as Jenk goes on to say this. We're not supposed to establish any religion. If you don't like that, get out of the country. You don't belong here, you're un-American. So first of all, Jenk has part of that correct. The United States does not establish a set religion. But then Jenk said this. If you don't like that, get out of the country. You don't belong here, you're un-American. That's not factually accurate and it's completely illogical. First of all, why is it factually inaccurate? Jenk says if you don't like that, you don't belong here. You're un-American. So Jenk thinks that if you hold a belief that is un-American, then you don't belong here. That's not true. That's not how America works. Does anyone remember learning about something called slavery? I think I'm saying that right, slavery? It was gone long before I was born, but I learned about it in history class. I personally think that it was a terrible thing, but it was something very American at one time. What I also remember learning about in history class was that there were a bunch of Americans who held a very un-American belief that slavery should not be allowed, even though the laws of the time allowed for slavery. So does anyone think that Jenk would tell all those people who opposed the laws that allowed slavery that they don't belong here? They're un-American? I don't want to speak for Jenk, but I doubt it. America is not a place where being un-American means you don't belong here. Politicians run on platforms talking about change all the time. What the heck would they be able to change if they had to refrain from being an American all the time? According to Jenk's reasoning, the only platform a politician should run on is consistency. Because if being an American means you don't belong here, then why would you run on a platform that lets everyone know you're an American? If you follow Jenk's logic, that kind of platform might get you elected, but it might also get you deported. Get out of the country. You don't belong here, you're un-American. People disagree about tax laws. 
That's un-American. Would Jenk tell all those people that they don't belong here? Again, probably not. Jenk's claim is factually inaccurate. It doesn't represent how America works. Americans can hold views that are un-American. And that doesn't mean that they don't belong here. There's actually an entire system in place in America, so if you have a view that is un-American, you can use that view, and you can vote in favor of your views, so that maybe the laws in America get closer to matching your personal views. Just like with slavery. At one point, it was very un-American to be opposed to slavery. But eventually, those Americans who were being un-American helped to align America more closely with their personal views. Opposing slavery was once un-American. Opposing slavery is now very American. Now why is what Cenk said completely illogical? The answer to that is simple. Cenk just got done telling us that the United States does not establish a religion. Our constitution says we shall not establish a religion. A religion can be something one believes in and follows devotedly, a point or matter of ethics or conscience. Then Cenk goes on to tell people if they don't like that belief, they don't belong here. So Cenk is essentially creating an America where there is an established belief that all Americans need to believe that America should not establish beliefs. What he's saying refutes itself. It would be like me saying viewers don't need to click the like button on this video, but viewers do need to click the like button on this video. It doesn't make logical sense to tell people to believe in something, but then also don't believe in that same thing. Now personally, I think it's good that the United States doesn't establish a set religion, because I think that forcing people to believe in something Thing is a stupid idea. That's why the show's called How to Be Christian and not You Need to Be Christian. I personally feel like the decision of what to believe in should be up to each person. For instance, if there's someone out there who thinks the United States should establish a religion, then that's your opinion. It's an un-American opinion, but who cares? This is America. That's what we do. I have un-American opinions. I think that abortion should be illegal in all cases. And if that ever happens, which I really hope it does, what is currently my un-American viewpoint will then turn into an American viewpoint. Because that's how things work here in America. I kind of would have thought that the host of the news program would have known such a thing. Anyway, Jenk next goes on to deliver some shocking news to the Christian community. And by the way, you're wrong about your Bible and you've been misled. You've been lied to. All right, so Bible's up here on Bible's down. Because I'm curious, what have we been misled and lied to about? I have to be honest with you. Your religious and political leaders have kept you in ignorance. The Bible is actually pro-abortion. Okay, question. The script here says gasp. Do you want me to just say the word gasp, or am I actually gasping? It's Numbers 511 to 31. It's about a woman, uh, and if you're not sure if your wife has cheated on you. If you've gone astray while married to your husband, and you have made yourself impure by having sexual relations with a man other than your husband, here the priest is to put the woman under this curse. May the Lord cause you to become a curse among your people when he makes your womb miscarry and your abdomen swell. May this water that brings a curse enter your body so that your abdomen swells or your womb miscarries. It is clear as day. There is no question about it. If you don't believe me, just go read the Bible. All right, so Jenk said to go read the Bible, so let's actually do that. The section that Jenk pulled a couple verses out of starts off by saying, the Lord said to Moses, speak to the Israelites and say to them, if a man's wife goes astray and is unfaithful to him so that another man has sexual relations with her, and this is hidden from her husband and her impurity is undetected since there is no witness against her and she has not been caught in the act, and if feelings of jealousy come over her husband and he suspects his wife and she is impure, or if he is jealous and suspects suspects her even though she is not impure, then he is to take his wife to the priest. He must also take an offering of a tenth of an F, uh, I don't know, of barley flour on her behalf. He must not pour olive oil on it or put incense on it, because it is a grain offering for jealousy, a reminder offering to draw attention to wrongdoing. So these are specific instructions for specific people. Who does the Lord tell Moses to tell this to? The Israelites. So a specific group of people were given these instructions. And it gets more specific from there. These are instructions for either married couples, in which the wife is unfaithful and her impurity goes undetected, and the husband has feelings of jealousy, or married couples in which the husband is jealous and suspects his wife of being impure, even though she's not. So what's about to be explained here is not something that single people would do. It's not even something that all married people would do. It's something that the Lord told Moses to tell these married Israelite couples to do if they met the specified criteria. And I point that out because Jenk is making the claim that the Bible is pro-abortion. The Bible is not pro-abortion, which we'll get into in a minute, but let's pretend for a second that Jenk actually found something here. Even if what Jenk just read was pro-abortion, it would just mean that the Bible is pro-abortion in certain circumstances. So it would have no impact on the issue that Jenk and Anna are discussing. Because for one, they're not talking about very specific married Israelite couples living in the past where the husband is questioning his wife's faithfulness. 
And for two, that wouldn't change the fact that the Bible is pro-life in literally every other circumstance. So even if this passage were pro-abortion, which it isn't, it would have absolutely no weight in the issue that Jenk and Anna are discussing, because they're not talking about very specific married Israelite couples living in the past, they're talking about Alabamans living today. Also, not everyone in Alabama believes in the Bible, so Jenk's entire Bible discourse doesn't have any impact on all of those science-believing pro-life people in Alabama who don't believe in the Bible. But let's continue. If a married couple meets this criteria, then the husband takes his wife to the priest. The priest shall bring her and have her stand before the Lord, then he shall take some holy water in a clay jar and put some dust from the tabernacle floor into the water. I know, I'm doing it again. Water, water, water. I know it's right, but it sounds weird to me. After the priest has the woman stand before the Lord, he shall loosen her hair and place in her hands the reminder offering, the grain offering for jealousy, while he himself holds the bitter water that brings a curse. Then the priest shall put the woman under oath and say to her, if no other man has had sexual relations with you and you have not gone astray and become impure while married to your husband, may this bitter water that brings a curse not harm you. But if you have gone astray while married to your husband and you have made yourself impure by having sexual relations with a man other than your husband, here the priest is to put the woman under this curse. May the Lord cause you to become a curse among your people when he makes your womb miscarry and your abdomen swell. May this water that brings a curse enter your body so that your abdomen swells or your womb miscarries. Then the woman is to say, Amen, so be it. Okay, so there's a lot of detail here, but there's also a lot of questions that go unanswered. One question is what if the woman is brought to the priest, and either on the way or before the curse, she admits to being unfaithful? Does that disqualify her from this whole process? Because the reason for going through this process, which Jenk never talked about when he was reporting the news, is to find out if she was unfaithful. So if she just comes out and admits to it, then there is really no need to do this process in terms of solving the mystery of whether she's unfaithful. And the reason I point that out is because Jenk said this. It's not even pro-choice, it's pro-abortion. But Jenk can't actually prove that. And one reason why he can't prove that is because the Bible never answers this question. Maybe the answer is yes, maybe the answer is no, maybe the answer is something else. If the answer is yes, it does disqualify her, then that would disprove Jenk's claim that this is not pro-choice, it's pro-abortion. It's not even pro-choice, it's pro-abortion. Because the woman can choose to skip the process that makes her womb miscarry, she could choose to save the baby's life by simply admitting to her unfaithfulness. Now just to be clear, the Bible does not give the answer to the question necessary to arrive at that conclusion. So we're not saying this is how things are. We're just pointing out another possibility to show that Jenk is jumping to conclusions and he's eliminating possibilities without actually having good reason to eliminate those possibilities. And that is why Jenk's claim is 100% false. It is not factual to say that the Bible is pro-abortion, because there is absolutely nothing in the Bible that can prove that claim. Now Numbers goes on to say, if she has made herself impure and been unfaithful to her husband, this will be the result. When she is made to drink the water that brings a curse and causes bitter suffering, it will enter her, her abdomen will swell, and her womb will miscarry, and she will become a curse. If, however, the woman has not made herself impure but is clean, she will be cleared of guilt and will be able to have children. A couple things about that. First of all, Jenk says this. It says if you think your wife has cheated on you, give her a toxic potion and make sure that she has an abortion. That's not what the Bible says at all. Make sure that she has an abortion. That's not even close to an accurate summary of what the Bible says. Nothing in this passage says to make sure she has an abortion. Nothing in this passage says to make sure she miscarries. The passage is giving instructions on how to find out if a wife is unfaithful if there is no evidence of her unfaithfulness. This passage gives two possible results. Jenk is saying that this passage teaches to make sure you only get this result. How is this guy hosting a news program? You don't have to answer that, I already know. Because on YouTube, any idiot can host anything they want. Jenk is telling us the word of Jenk. He's not telling us the word of God. But guess what Jenk wants us to believe? It says if you think your wife has cheated on you, give her a toxic potion and make sure that she has an abortion. I didn't say it. I didn't say it. Jenk was the only one who said it. It's not something found in the Bible. But Jenk then denies having made up that teaching. And it gets more entertaining from there because guess who Jenk tries to pin this on? Your God said it. Your God said it. My God said no such thing. Jenk said it. I didn't say it. It says if you think your wife has cheated on you, give her a toxic potion and make sure that she has an abortion. I didn't say it. 
Jenk said it. Also, Jenk is using one of the few translations of the Bible that actually use the word miscarry or miscarriage in that verse. There's a link in the description that shows a bunch of different translations of that verse. That way you can see that Jenk is using one of the more rare translations of that verse. That being said, on that page you can also find a translation that is even more rare than the one that Jenk used. The translation is the ERV, which is the easy to read version of the Bible. Not a joke, that's actually what that stands for. And it says if that is true, you will have much trouble when you drink this special water. You will not be able to have any children, and if you are pregnant now, your baby will die. So while I don't think that many people go to the ERV, the easy to read version of the Bible for completely accurate translations, I just wanted to point out that this version of the Bible is out there, and it does discuss a baby dying if the mother was unfaithful. Now even if this ERV translation of the Bible was the most accurate translation of the Bible, would that prove Jenk's point? Of course not. Even if the baby is aborted through this process, Jenk has no way of proving his claim that the Bible is pro-abortion. All he would have proven is that the Bible discusses a process that could possibly end in an abortion. The United States has laws that prohibit murder. God has laws that prohibit adultery. The United States has possible consequences set in place for murderers, one of which could be the death penalty. God has possible consequences set in place for adulterers, one of which could abort a child. By Jenk's reasoning, if he wants to say that the Bible is pro-abortion, then he would also have to say that the United States is pro-murder. The problem though is that Jenk is looking at the punishment and he's ignoring everything else. The formula for both of these cases is don't do A under any circumstances. If A is done, then B could happen. So these punishments could happen, but won't necessarily happen if you do these actions. The United States says don't do this action. God says don't do this action. If everyone listens to the United States and to God, then no one does A, which means B never happens. So the United States is teaching people to live in a way that prevents all murders. And God is teaching people to live in a way that prevents all abortions. How incredibly pro-life of God and his Bible. Jenk skips over everything else that the Bible teaches, and he just highlights a couple verses, and then he twists them into saying what he wants them to say and not what they actually say. And then on top of that, he blames his poor reading comprehension skills on God. I didn't say it, I didn't say it. Your God said it, your God said it. The Bible is not pro-abortion in any way. And Cenk Uger delivers a lot of false information for the host of a news program. He gives false information about America and he gives false information about the Bible. Now do I hope that Cenk and the people at the Young Turks actually start reporting factual information? Yeah, as always though, this channel is not about telling people what to do. I think it would be great if they started reporting the facts, but that decision is up to them. This has been Bibles Down on how to be Christian. If you enjoyed watching this, please click the like button. And if you want to see future videos, click subscribe and that notification bell. That way you can be alerted when they come out. Thank you all for watching and have a great day.